Um, my name is Elaine Buck. I'm the technical manager at uh, EMAC. Um, I, my ro roles and responsibilities at EMAC is the technical direction and uh, input into the projects that come through uh, EMAC. So I would like to, first of all, thank, before we get started, um, Ocean Aeronet, who funded our project. Um, Karen Frazier is here today, um, who represents um, the program manager, really, for Ocean Aeronet. Karen, you might want to just raise your hand. Um, she's also with the Scottish Enterprise, who were the funders from the EMAC side. Um, Innovate UK for uh, the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult and the Swedish Energy Agency for uh, SP Research. So thank you uh, to them for, for making this project happen. So I'm here really to go over the agenda for the, couple, uh, the next couple of days and really to set the stage and the background for the project. So really what we've done is, you know, from EMEC's uh, perspective, um, we have seen a lot of failures that have happened uh, in the sea. Um, going back uh, a step further, Ocean Aeronet, uh, or sorry, the Ocean Energy uh, Europe has come out with their research and innovation agenda. And really the, the key aims of that agenda is to improve reliability and survivability of ocean energy devices to reduce the perceived risks of the ocean energy technologies, as well as lowering the cost. And they want to do this all in this, in this order. So from EMEX perspective, what we witness and what we see um, are the number of component failures that actually happen in the sea. So these slides are just a few examples of some of the smaller components that have actually failed um, at EMEX. So you can see a, a brake caliper bolt that sheared off after 24 hours uh, in the sea. We have actually have a lot of umbilical cables that have actually separated, um, and then of course once we lose those cables, we're losing data um, that we're recording at the time. So this is a very expensive amount of uh, operation to go back in and having to, to lift um, the device out to, to replace some umbilical cords. Um, we also see a lot of uh, damage from the highly corrosive environment that the uh, salt water the components in the salt water are, uh, undergo, as well as the extreme conditions and the loading um, that the, the devices are under. So this is just some small examples of some of the components that happen to fail, and these were actually uh, reported on and discussed as part of a project that, the, that EMEC did with the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. And this is a report with some of the analysis of some of these smaller components that you can actually um, access and do more of a read on, uh, and that's on their website. So in terms of real extreme uh, examples, this next slide is an example of uh, what's happened at Billy Accru. Um, this is a, a set of four mooring buoys, um, and I am from Texas, so I will say buoy. I apologize, I know that is incorrect from everybody else's perspective over here, but that's just me. Uh, but this set of mooring buoys was to hold in place a, a WEC device. Um, we had a, a, an extreme storm that came through, and one of the buoys uh, was actually, the, the cable failed, and we found the buoy uh, crushed uh, in a crevice along uh, inside the coast um, offshore or Orkney. So this is a real good example of what happens if we have a mooring failure and if this had been a WEC, the, uh, you know, the extreme damage and cost that this would have been to, uh, to a developer. Luckily it was only a buoy. Um, so we do understand that it is imperative that we have to improve reliability and survivability of these devices. So how are we going to do that is we definitely need more data. We need more field data. Um, we do know that there is very limited data out there. It's mainly covered under confidentiality um, uh, and or we just don't have enough devices that have been out in the sea long enough to actually collect um, proper data. Um, however, we are starting to see a change um, with most developers that if it is a component or if it's a subsystem that is not tied in with their IP, they are starting to be more willing to sit there and share that data. So uh, EMEC is very um, uh, responsive of being able to work with developers to see if we can do more 
data collection um, for reliability. Um, and then this has started our discussion and our position of where we want to be to help move the industry forward with uh, bringing more reliability data to, uh, to, the, to the masses. So uh, in order to do this, um, uh, because we know that there is a lack of data, um, we also need to uh, pretty much put in place good condition monitoring. Um, the condition <coughs> monitoring and field data, it becomes absolutely evident. Um, and we are hoping that this is developed through what is the next stage of this project called RIASOR2. Um, it hasn't been funded yet. We're um, all, uh, all directions are looking good for this. Um, but we would hope that uh, this will come out through the, the RIASOR2 project uh, soon. So as the move, uh, industry starts to move also from single devices into the uh, arrays, we do anticipate uh, that we'll see more of the component subsystem and full system reliability data that will help to underpin the O&M uh, schedules that we'll start to see. But at the moment, we are still you know, um, restricted by the amount of data that we can uh, use. The, we know, though, that the engineers and the developer teams um, have been using different reliability assessment methods um, that are out there. Uh, we have reliability block diagrams to the tools of fail, failure mode and effect analysis and crit criticality uh, analysis. Um, however, we do know that there are still large uncertainties being able to use these uh, methodologies. And so really the RIASOR project is to address an attempt to quantify the uncertainties that, um, that are occurring throughout the data sets that we see. And through the VMEA analysis, uh, in order to point out some rational ways of being able to reduce these uncertainties. The experience that EMAC sees uh, at our test sites in the sea, the, experiment, uh, the experience that the catapult has um, uh, at the NARAC, uh, sites on the drive trains and all the electrical testing that they do in the labs, um, as well as SP research experience in the automotive and um, uh, uh, aeronautics industries and sectors. This all brings together a unique team to sit there and be able to learn how we can adapt this uh, methodology to uh, the wave and tidal sector. <coughs> So without further ado, uh, I'll hand this over to Thomas, who will lead us through the methodology. Thank you. I'm a statistician. <coughs> uh, so uh, most of you, I suppose, are engineers working with really difficult stuff. But we, Per and I, we are statisticians, and we try to sort of use, uh, take this engineering knowledge and uh, use some mathematical statistics to uh, create a good tool to find the reliability. Uh, so the tool that we have worked with is, is, is called the VMEA, Variation Mood and Effect Analysis. And we have worked with that uh, in many different <coughs> applications during the years, especially in automotive and uh, so uh, aeronautic uh, uh, problems. And now we think it's good to, to try to use this uh, methodology also in this, uh, this application. I think it's very important to, to try to understand the idea behind this methodology because it's not uh, what engineers are used to. Because engineers usually try to be on the safe side in all steps. <laughs> So in each step, you're on the safe side, and that is really the, the engineering thinking in, the, in, uh, in construction. But uh, what we think is rather that you should not do that. You should actually calculate the life or the strength or whatever it is as good as you can. You want to have the expected value first, and then you take all the uncertainties put them together and create a safety factor. So that is the, the, the main idea of this methodology. It's simple, but it's not so <coughs> familiar, I think, to, to engineers. Uh, in uh, this application we are talking about, <coughs> with wave energy, 
uh, you could describe uh, the calculation sch scheme in this way, that you have first the waves, or you have the current when it's tidal, and from these waves you use some standard tools, maybe from the from uh, DNB tools, uh, to find the <coughs> Uh, significant wave height, HS, and uh, uh, the period for the waves, or simply the velocity for the current. So you re reduce the real uh, environment just to a few numbers, or distribution of numbers. Then from this you, you use uh, some hydrodynamical uh, model, some numerical model, and uh, apply that to the equipment that you have to find what forces and movements do you have on your equipment. What uh, forces uh, are caused by these waves. And then when you have done that, you have to go further and then you use a structural model. So you again use your uh, <coughs> equipment and also put in some material properties and put everything in, for example, a finite element model to calculate what are the stresses in the hot spots in this, uh, <coughs> in this equipment. And then as a last step, from this hot spot stress, you compare with material uh, properties and try to find what is the life for the equipment. So there are several steps we do here. Uh, in, uh, in calculating or assessing the life of the structure. <clears throat> the problem is <clears throat> that even if we have extremely good uh, computer resources nowadays, there are <clears throat> variation and errors. And here, variation, I have symbolized that with these uh, red uh, <coughs> arrows. So uh, we have variation in waves and current, that in nature, of course. So waves and current vary in time, they vary within sites, and they vary between sites. We have to take that into account, this variation. But also the equipment varies in geometry and quality, because we have certain uh, limits for, uh, for the manufacturers, uh, we have uh, tolerance intervals and so on, but within these intervals there will be variation. So uh, the equipment will also vary. And then also material properties. Uh, you, you make a test or you have a specification of material, but the truth is that there is a quite large variation around these specified values. And this is both within the batches and between batches and, of course, between suppliers, because you may change supplier and then you may change the material behavior. So there's a lot of variation which have to be take, taken into account. And this is something that you usually do in reliability <coughs> methodology, because it's quite straightforward to take this into account. You can use statistical methods for it. What's this worth? is possible errors, but we have a lot also of possible errors here. <coughs> For example, in the first step, when you go from waves to significant wave heights, you go from a complex multi-dimensional <coughs> uh, wave movements, and you approximate it just with two numbers. So there you introduce some uh, bias, some error. In a hydrodynamic model, of course, that's a numerical model, a physical mathematical model, which, <coughs> you, which you also will be uh, erroneous in some way. And if you have not calibrated it, you know, have not validated it in, uh, in, uh, in real environment, then you have to take into account that there may be quite large errors in these uh, calculations. And also, uh, the equipment itself is approximated by a drawing. You put a drawing into your, your calculation uh, and not the real equipment. And the drawing is also an approximation. And then we have also possible model errors. 
in uh, structural and life models. For life models, for example, we, we talk a lot about fatigue, and fatigue is uh, usually modeled by the Wöhler curve, that is extremely simple linear curve invented in the 1550 or something like that. And uh, we have not come so much further. <laughs> so we use this very simple method to estimate fatigue, uh, strength and fatigue life. So there we also introduce arrows. <clears throat> so we have a straightforward way to calculate life or strength yeah. along these blue uh, arrows. But in each step we know that we have both variation and we have arrows. And the problem is how shall we control all these uh, uncertainties, which we can call it with a, with a common name. And also one more, it's the possible equivalence errors between laboratory and service conditions. That's also a typical error that you make a test in laboratory on material and then you apply that to a component uh, where it will not be exactly in the same conditions. <coughs> So we have to take this into account. <clears throat> and now this is where VMEA came in. So the VMEA then takes the expected calculated life as a starting point. As I said before, we do not uh, <coughs> be on the safe side on each step here, but we really try to, to calculate the nominal life, the life that we really believe in, which we bet most on. This is the life that we want to calculate. Uh, that I call that the nominal life. Then we <clears throat> assign a common uncertainty metric to each error and variation source. And this sounds simple, but it's not so simple. Because if we want to now uh, combine all these sources, both random sources, as the variation also is, uh, often is, and errors, possible errors, and it's not so easy to, to, to get a, a common measure, a common metric to these things. But we have chosen to use the standard deviation as such a common metric. For the statistical cases it's quite straightforward, <coughs> but for the other cases it's more difficult and not really <coughs> correct in a statistical sense. So we have to accept that as statisticians. I think it's more easy to accept for engineers. So what we do is that we take all these, <coughs> all these uh, errors, we put them together. We release them from, uh, from the line here, put them together. <coughs> and then we calculate an overall uncertainty. So from these, all these errors, we calculate an overall uncertainty. And this uncertainty we use some simple statistical methods to make a safety distance of it. And a safety distance that is uh, equivalent to a safety factor. And how is that? That's because we usually work in log scale. So in log scale it's a distance and in linear scale it's a safety factor. We'll come to that later. So then what we have, the goal, the reliability goal, is that the nominal life should be larger than this safety distance plus the target life. So that is uh, the simple uh, methodology. And it sounds simple, doesn't it? The real difficulty here is, of course, to find all these standard deviations. And there is, uh, it's not uh, enough to be a statistician, but there you really need to be an engineer and understand each source here and have a good experience to understand how large could, could these possible errors be. So that's why it's so important here to have these uh, cooperations, cooperation between the knowledgeable uh, engineer and 
the mathematical mathematician or statistician. If we now compare this uh, to uh, how uh, usual reliability methodologies are, then, as I said, usually you take height for uncertainties in each step. For example, this uh, Euro code and such codes, uh, they, they do that actually. They, they put a, they call the characteristics value and the design value, calculate for each part, and then they put them together. And this design value is always, uh, uh, we have taken height for that so. So that is the, the usual way to do it. <coughs> and this variation is then handled by using statistical uh, safe quantiles, for example, the 5% or 1% life, 1% strength, or the worst case scenarios. And model errors, they are handled by conservatism. That's, uh, usually it's not handled in a rational way, but you just try to be conservative just by choosing, choosing the models that, that exaggerate severity and weakness. <clears throat> and this, of course, it works, but there is a risk that you over-design your, your uh, equipment, because you really don't know how much height you have taken for everything. That's uh, <clears throat> something that is very difficult to estimate if you do in this way. One typical such situation that uh, is uh, in, in, when we had a quite heavy snowfall in Sweden, maybe four or five years ago. There was a lot of roofs that broke in Sweden. But they were all uh, designed after the Eurocode, uh, which have um, special, <coughs> they have different, uh, different uh, extra safety factors, I know, for different parts of Sweden and also for Europe. So they have really used the, the correct safety factors. But the problem, I think, is that when they invented these safety factors, maybe 50 years ago, <laughs> or something like that, then uh, they had not so good uh, numerical instruments, not so good uh, finite element modeling, modeling, but they calculate by hand. And then they had a little bit extra safety already in the calculations, because every engineer wants to be on the safe side. <laughs> but then, when you had computers could calculate everything perfect, then you came closer to the truth, and this extra safety factor didn't, uh, was not enough. That's my theory. <laughs> but that's something that can happen when you don't have control over the, the conservatism. You just take something, and that is also very individual. So that is something that we try to, to avoid by this methodology. Of course, this methodology also includes a lot of subjective judgments and so on. But we think it's still more controlled. So uh, <coughs> this is uh, the methodology. Then, uh, if you look a little bit theoretically about it, it's, you can say that it's based on the assumption that all sources of variation and possible errors can be regarded as independent random variables. <clears throat> and this means that the likelihood of combination of worst cases can be controlled by statistical laws. So the overall uncertainty is calculated by adding the individual variance contributions. It means that we calculated overall uncertainty by the sum of the squares of the standard deviation. And there is a, a theoretical motivation for that, because if, if all of these sources were random variables, really random variables, then this is the correct way to do it. <laughs> then we really get the correct uh, uncertainty. So the problem here is that we don't have that. But still, this is the best thing that we can do. But the motivation for this adding the squares is this idea that is a random variables. And that is, it has quite large implications, because since you add the squares, only the, there are only a few dominating uh, sources, and many can be neglected.
call the basic VMAA, which is uh, mostly useful in the, in the earlier uh, stages of design, so when you look at different concepts and compare different concepts. And then when you get more information, then you can get better knowledge about your uncertainties. And then when you go into the more detailed design phase, when you really want to set safety factors, then you can have even more information. So there, there you need a, a more uh, real probabilistic methods. So that's what we call the probabilistic BME. So I will uh, explain, I set this in, into, into, into the product development. And uh, so this also in, in relation to the uh, design process for, for MEX, which also Thomas mentioned here. And then I, I will focus on the first and the last step here about the basic VMEA and about the probabilistic VMEA. I will also demonstrate it by using examples from, from a mooring, mooring rope. So uh, VMEA, so that, what that is, it is a reliability evaluation method. So uh, here is a, a, an example which I've taken from a, a work that we've done together with Volvo Aero. So it is, in this case, it uh, is the results from an evaluation of, uh, of this this, com this component here in a jet engine. And this table is the typical output of a, of a, of a BME, of the analysis here. So what this table shows is that each row here that is uh, an identified source of uncertainty and the number here that says the size of this uncertainty. So here we have identified a number of uncertainties and then uh, at the, the, the bottom Bottom right there is the total uncertainty. And I will explain this table in more detail here, but I just want to put up what is the, the real result here. Uh, okay, so th th there are different kinds of uncertainties here. There are some of the scatter of material properties, uh, statistical uncertainties, there are geometrical variations, uh, model uncertainties about model errors, and uh, uncertainties about the load. And when you have this this table and you have a number for each each of the source. Then you can say which which source is the largest one, which one is is it that dominates. And this then gives us guidance on which source should we work on in order to improve the reliability and re reduce the uncertainty. So that I mean how can uncertainty be, be, be decreased in order to get the best result here? And, and uh, since this both incorporates both the, the scatter sources and also model errors, then we can also use it to see what is the, a good balance between the scatter, which is the unavoidable render variation, versus the model errors that we can uh, make better if we, if we make uh, uh, better models or get better data. So that is also a way to to balance the, the model complexity. Okay, so this was an example here of the result from a VMA. Uh, this is also much about uh, robustness, reliability and robustness, that we want to be robust to variation sources. And then often used the engineering method in reliability is the FMEA, the, the failure mode and effect analysis. And the FMEA method that aims at finding all possible causes of failures. So you have the causes, have the failure mode and the failure effect. So that is the, the, the basis of the FMEA. And then you also look at the criticality. But there have been studies that uh, shown that the, the causes here, they're actually then triggered by variation sources, by unwanted variation. And that is actually I mean, the background to the BMA. That instead of looking at the causes, we look at the sources of variation that triggers the causes. And also this acronym BMA that's quite close to FMEA, so that is also the background behind that. And that is actually not our invention, it is uh, our colleagues from the Shannon's University of Technology uh, in the quality sciences that worked on this end and invented this acronym, the variation mode in effect analysis. 
so that was a little bit about background on, uh, on the EMEA. And if we now look at the, the engineering process, and especially how you treat a system engineering, that means when you have a project which consists of uh, lots of different parts, systems and subsystems and components, uh, that becomes a quite big, big problem. So you need to treat it uh, in a systematic way. And uh, uh, quite common a way to think about this uh, in engineering or system in engineering is to, that you start here with a full system and set the functional specifications and requirements. And then you break these requirements down onto system, from the system level to the subsystem level. And then from the subsystem to the component level. And it is on the component level where you really can work and solve the problems. And it's also here where we have it, then it worked with the EMEA on the, on the component level. And then you go up through this V, where it then validates the design, first on the component level, and then you can validate, validate the design on the subsystem level, and finally on the system level. So this is a, a, a method of thinking in, in the system engineering and uh, reliability. And this picture I see is taken from the automotive industry, but it is quite generic to any kind of uh, industry. So this would fit you quite well if you replace the car here by, uh, by a wave boy or by some other kind of marine energy converter to try to, try to break down the requirements. Uh, and this picture is similar to the one that Thomas showed uh, about the design process for marine energy converters. The input here, that is our, our environment, which means that this, it is the, the loads from the, the marine loads, for the sea loads, for example, the, the waves or the currents. And then uh, we have some kind of device here. This is exemplified by, by a wave energy boy. In order to analyze this, then we need to know how this moves in the water. That we use. So we need to have a model for how the, to go from the sea to the forces of the device. And then we also need to have a, a, a model to go from the forces to the actual stresses in the places where there will be the actual failure, the hot spots of the, of the components. And in this case, uh, I've exemplified it uh, with the fatigue life. So when you know the stresses, then you're, you're not finished yet, but you need to go another step to, to analyze or assess the actual the fatigue life of this component. And then we have also fatigue models, for example, the Verla curve and the damage accumulation hypothesis. So I think this is a, I mean, a typical design process for a a component in a, in, a, in a marine energy converter. So it can, it can be, for, for example, this uh, is uh, from the example that Thomas will show tomorrow. It can also be uh, the mooring line, which have the same calculation. And as we will also see tomorrow, also for the electrical components, it looks quite similar. But still for the electrical components, also the, the sea loads, that is the input, actual input load that we need to design for. For the basic VMA, the goal there is to get a, a, a first view of what are the uncertainties and what are the approximate sizes and the sensitivities to these uncertainties. And that can be useful, for example, if you have different uh, design concepts, different solutions, and you want to, to analyze which one seems to be the most promising one, which, which one should we con continue with. And uh, this is the, the procedure that we propose that you should use. Uh, so uh, there are seven points here, uh, which then defines the VMA procedure. You can say, say that it is defined into four different blocks. The first is to define the problem, and the second one, the green, is to analyze. And then we evaluate the results, and then the last and, and uh, not least important is see what can we do to improve the design. 
So uh, for define, then we need to define what we call here the target function. What is it that we want to look at? Is it the life of a component, or the maximum stress, or the maybe the maximum defect? And then the, the analyze step here is to find all the different sources of uncertainty and to make a sensitivity assessment of these sources and then make an uncertainty size assessment. And the, and the value step, then we uh, calculate the total uncertainty and then evaluate the reliability and robustness. For example, uh, we can see which sources dominate. And uh, when we go further in design, it's about calculating safety factors for the design. But is, is, is this design good enough or not? And then based on what we have done, of course, uh, we need to sit down and think, what can we do to improve this component if there is a need and a need for it? So I will now uh, go through these uh, steps and say what they mean in some more detail about the basic VMA. Uh, so <coughs> when it comes to the, the target function definition, we uh, here then define the target function. So that is to say which properties that we want to study. So th that need to come from the engineering process that we have identified when we break down the system to the subsystem the component and looking at the design process. For example, it can be the life of the mooring line or the life of some structural component or the, the life of, a, of some electrical component. And when it comes to marine energy, there are typically two cases that you need to design for. Uh, one of them is uh, that, w that we need to decide for a life criteria, uh, a life requirement. So we need to make the component uh, durable, so for durability. <coughs> and the second one is uh, survivability. It means that we need to s design it to survive the largest, largest wave, basically. And in uh, both of these cases, uh, uh, <coughs> We use, we propose that to use the reliability method. The, ne uh, the next step is to identify the sources of uncertainty here. And when it comes to the basic VMA, uh, often it is mostly the variations also, the random variations that are easier to, to think about in this earlier stage of the design. And here it is important to try to uh, capture all different possible sources of uncertainty. And therefore it is important to have different views and competences and to make, uh, make use of a cross-functional team of experts as I write here. So try to take in people with different expertise and also to use the previous knowledge that has been, or previous things that has been done in the design process. For example, if there has been an FMICA then you can use this to see what were the, the causes here, so you can use this to help to find different sources of uncertainty. Uh, another tool is the fish bone diagram, where it's, it's, a good, it's a good way to illustrate you know, how the uncertainty has come in. Uh, another tool is what is called the P diagram, where P stands for either can be product or if it is a process, the industrial process that you look at. See that you have some noise, which is the random variation. You have some uh, control factor that is the parameters that you can control in the, your product. And then maybe there are some signal factors for something, in, input signal. And then the output is the noise. So this, this is a, a conceptual model that also can help to understand your, your, your system or, or your component to see what are the different sources of uncertainty. Another way to think about it is, uh, here is uh, five categories of evil here. This is a picture that uh, has been used in the automotive industry. Uh, this is another way to categorize the different kind of uncertainties. Here it is uh, in five different categories. Uh, where about to refer to the deterioration of products due to aging, that is typical in mean, the, for example, the fatigue phenomenon or wear phenomenon or corrosion. Uh, 
uh, external env environmental conditions the products are exposed to. When it comes to, to cars, it is typical they are driven on roads, so that is the input from the roads. Internal environmental conditions. Uh, that can be heat transfer from uh, one component to another. That can be important in certain cases. Sometimes it is not important at all, but it depends on the kind of component that you look at. Uh, customer behavior that uh, the products are exposed to. I mean, all all uh, customers use their car in a different way, so there will be a variability in how customers use the car. And the car also needs to be produced in some way. And uh, this means that, that, that in the manufacturing there will be, will be imperfections and there will be tolerances on different things, which will then also introduce variations. And the bottom line here is that we, we can't eliminate these factors, but we need to live with them and we need to take them into account in a rational way. So our approach here is then to treat these as our sources of variation and then estimate the effect of these, these uh, sources of, of uncertainty and uh, then take them into account when we make the design and uh, set the safety. The pictures here, they represent uh, the automotive industry, an example from the automotive industry. Uh, but what I would like to discuss here is uh, if are these five categories are they valid also in other applications and especially for our application here about the marine energy converters. So about the wear out, external environment, internal environment, customer behavior, and manufacturing imperfections. So are these five categories irrelevant? And uh, if so. Uh, what uncertainties can the categories represent? Uh, so, uh, these were at least five pictures that, that I found that could represent uh, these different kind of these five categories of evil. And then uh, there should be there could be a sixth box here, which about the, the installation and the maintenance. Uh, one comment here about uh, the customer behavior. One way to think about the customer behavior is that we we don't know in what kind of wave climate we will put our boy. So that is, you can say that that, that could be a choice of the customer. The vice vice boy, and then decides then where to put it. So that that, that could be a, a quite sub substantial source of variation about the which wave climate is it put in. And uh, oh, so here are some, some examples of some waves and some reduction of the Palamis. Okay, so let's move on here. Uh, so here, uh, the first simple example here uh, for the basic beam here is about a, a mooring rope. And in this case, the, the target function is the life of the mooring rope. So that is what we're inter interested to look at, uh, the life of the mooring rope. And in fact, here we have two different uh, design solutions that we want to look at. One is uh, steel wire, another one is, is a polyester rope. And uh, in uh, this case, we have identified uh, these six sources of uncertainty here. Uh, about the load variation, and then there is an uncertainty in the assessment of the load at the actual site that we look at. Uh, that we discussed later, that even though we have buoy measurements, that doesn't correspond to other kind of measurements. So that there's certainly an uncertainty here. Uh, and then from the strength, there's an uncertainty in the in the fatigue life model. And then then we know that there's also quite substantial scatter in the fatigue life that we cannot avoid. And it was, when it comes to geometry, then uh, there could be also some uh, geometry variations. And uh, environment, uh, other effects within the course are uh, uncertainty due to the environment. So then we we, we want to assess the size and the, and, the, and the sensitivity and the size of these uncertainties. And here is uh, a figure to show what we what we mean by the sensitivity here. Uh, this example this example of a pendulum. So here on the x-axis is the length 
of the pendulum, and on the y-axis it is the, the, the period in the seconds. And uh, this represents a quite a uh, non-linear relationship. So if we choose a very short pendulum length, then it will be very sensitive to any say, error in, in the length. But well, if, we, if we choose a very long one, then it will become less sensitive. So this is what we, what we should think about when we think about the sensitivity to the sources of uncertainty. And here it is illustrated by five small distributions here. And the size of the distribution is then, if it's how narrow it is. So here uh, is the blue one that represents the, a wider distribution, which means that there is larger uncertainty in this source. So if you have larger uncertainty, then, then of course the resulting uncertainty will then also become larger. Uh, now when it comes to the basic beam here, there we use a more simplified scale than the actual physical, physical slope here. So the idea here is that we, without having any measurements, the engineers or experts can judge what is the, the sensitivity and what is the uncertainty size here. So therefore we use a scale from 1 to 10, where 1 is the lowest one and 10 is the highest one and 5, 6 is in the middle, so it represents a medium size and, uh, and 10 represents very high uncertainty and, and one very low uncertainty and the corresponding to the sensitivity one is that it's almost not sensitive at all and uh, 10 is that it's very sensitive to this source and then we can simply judge this, you know, all these six uh, different uh, sources are certain. So it is for the steel wire, for the polyester wire. In this case, uh, some engineers has sat down and uh, evaluated and judged these numbers purely based on, on, on experience. And what we can see here, the difference here about uh, the steel wire and the polyester rope is then uh, about the fatigue model. That, uh, the uncertainty in the fatigue model is much larger for the polyester growth. That is the, the main difference. I will not go into more detail than this. And then the next step here about calculating the total uncertainty, which also Thomas mentioned before, is that the, the, the orange ones here is the input, and then from this input we compute the result. So the resulting uncertainty is a multiplication of the sensitivity and the uncertainty size. So that represents the standard deviation. And then the variation contribution here, that should be in terms of the variance. So the, what we call is the VRPN, the variation risk priority number. That is the square of the resulting uncertainty. So it is the sum of squares, and then we, if we look at the total risk, total uncertainty here, then it is the, the root sum of squares of the uncertainties. And what this means is that the, in the total uncertainty here, it is the largest uncertainty, uncertainty that really dominates. So if we have a, a small uncertainty, it is uh, not important at all. It will almost vanish. So it uh, means that it's focusing on, on, on automatically on the largest uncertainty. And when we look at the pro proportions of the different uncertainties, we should, get, should look at the proportions of the variance. So, proportions in terms of the variation risk priority number. Priority number. And uh, that is what is shown here in these pie charts. Uh, so, there is the steel wire and the polyester rope. And the overall size here of this surface that represents the, the total VRPN. So you can see that the total uncertainty for the polyester rope is larger than for the steel wire. But then we can also here see which parts dominate here, which uncertainty sources are the largest ones. And in this case, it is the orange, yellow, and the green ones, which is the scattering fatigue life uncertainty and fatigue uh, model and the uncertainty due to environment. No, sorry, the, the, the uncertainty and load assessment should, should be. So based on, uh, on uh, this quite simple engineering judgment, 
we can now compare these two design alternatives, the seal wire and the polyester rope. And what we can see is that the, the polyester rope has larger uncertainties, and uh, mostly due to that it is uh, not as well understood as the steel, so there is larger uncertainties in the fatigue models for the poly polyester rope. Uh, so the improvement actually, so the way to go forward here is that the, the steel wire, that's quite well understood, so that, that probably is the, is the main candidate here for the design. And if we should go for the polyester rope, then probably we need to do some, uh, some further investigations about the fatigue properties of the polyester rope in order to be able to, uh, well, well, to get, get more knowledge and uh, and get a better design and not to, to, to otherwise we need to make a quite big over design of the, of, of the polyester rope if we don't understand the fatigue properties. So this is an example of, of how you can use the basic beam here you know, to, to compare two different design solutions. Then I will uh, go on to the probabilistic beam here where the goal is to get uh, a more detailed, based on more detailed information, to get uh, a better assessment of the sensitivities and the uncertainty sizes. That means that we need to have more understanding of, about the models and make calculations, get better data, for example. Uh, and one useful way to think uh, about this is to think about the load and the strength and about the load and the strength diagram. So the red curve here, which then represents a statistical distribution, uh, represents the, the load distribution, which means that it is the uncertainty in the load. And the blue one is the, the strength distribution. And uh, failure occurs when the load uh, exceeds the strength. So that is the, the basic failure criterion here. When, when the load is larger than strength, then it's a failure. And then we can see what, what are the, the sources of uncertainty here on the load side and on the strength side. For example, the, the ones that I discussed before on the identification of the uncertainties in the basic theme here, that's it's basically the same. It's a, it's got a customer variation and the environment and load estimation. We, we need to estimate the actual wave climate on the site that we are looking at. And typical uncertainties in strength is the material, uh, for example, type and surface and the defects of the material, uh, manufacturing variations, uh, which can then be uh, geometry variations and uh, different kind of modelings, for example, the uh, hydrodynamic models and the fatigue model and the fatigue model. So here I exemplify it with the uh, waveform. So the, the basic procedure for all three kinds of DMA, the, the basic enhanced and the probabilistic one, it is the same. But as I said, uh, here, as we move further towards than the probabilistic one, then we have more data, more knowledge, so we can get better estimates of the uncertainties. So, in this case, uh, it is the fatigue life of the mooring rope. So we, we want to look at the durability of the mooring rope. And the life requirement here, that is typically 20 or 25 years, uh, what I understood from this industry. That is what, what it's aimed for. And now when it comes then to identifying uncertainties, in the basic DMA, it was mostly that we looked at variation sources and a little bit about possible model errors. But here, when we want to derive the real safety margin for the design, then we need to understand all these steps in the, in the design process in more detail. We need to understand exactly what kind of sea states are we looking, are we looking at, for example, the histogram of the, of the the scatter diagram of the sea states, and uh, to look at the, the model from sea, uh, sea loads to forces, and to see what are the 
the models by making calculations and varying the different input par parameters, for example. And also for the uh, finite element model that can be used, for example, for, to compute the forces from the forces to the stress. So here it becomes more important to look at not only at, at the say random variation, but also to look at the possible uncertainties, both when it comes to model uncertainties, but also statistical uncertainties. So uh, scatter, which is the random variation, statistical uncertainties, which is typically that we have parameters in our models that we need to estimate. And we typically we estimate them by making some kind of experiments, and then we fit some model and estimate the param parameter. And on top of that, uh, the model that we use, that is only a model of the reality, so there will be some discrepancy between the model and what's actually there in reality. And what is important here, uh, or why we, why, we, why we want to distinguish between these, is because the scatter, that is the random variation, that cannot be eliminated. In some, some cases we can control it, by example, for setting the tolerances in our design or choosing the material quality. But it cannot be eliminated. When it comes to the statistical uncertainty and the model uncertainty, they can, at least in principle, be eliminated. Or at least they can be reduced. For example, if we make more tests to calibrate our models, then we will reduce the uncertainties here. Or if we make some, um, some new research in order to get a better model, then we will increase our knowledge and also then have the possibility to decrease the model uncertainty. So the, the, that way, the, the, well, this is a quite important distinction between the scatter and the other uncertainties here. Uh, when it comes to the sensitivity uncertainty size, here in the probabilistic VMA, we use the real physical metrics, which means that the, for the sensitivities, it is the this is the slope here of the curve. That is the, the, uh, the sensitivity coefficient that we use, the physical sensitivity coefficient. And when it comes to the uncertainty size, it is uh, the standard deviation that we use, instead of the 1 to 10 scale that we used in the basic beam area. And in mathematical terms, that means that the sensitivity co coefficient is a derivative, and uh, then the uncertainty is the standard deviation. So this is the result of the, the correspond, corresponding example here of the Morin rope. Uh, here is, is the, since it was, was the steel rope that was the most promising, that was the one that I present here. Uh, and here in this process, uh, you can see that there are some more uncertainties that has been added compared to the basic theme here. And that is quite typical that when you learn to understand the process and the product uh, better, and we go into more details, then there will be some, some more details here also in the, in the different uncertainties. But basically there is the sensitivity coefficient and the standard deviation, and then in the middle there is a, a t-correction factor, which depends on if we, if we estimate uh, uh, from data, then it depends on how much data do we have. If we have a, quite a, a little data, then this t-factor will be larger. If, it, if we have a very much data, and it will be one. That is a correction for this. And then in the bottom right corner there, there is the total uncertainty, which is then calculated in the same way as for the basic EMEA, by taking the root sum of square. So this is the, actually then the value that we will use from this table if we want to derive a safety factor for the design or look at the safety margin. Uh, but if we then first here look at the, this pie chart, which then uh, tells us uh, the different contributions of the uh, uncertainties here. We can see that there are quite a lot of uh, small ones here, which uh, in this case are more or less irrelevant. So we, 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 there's no real need to study them anymore or in more detail. Uh, but there are three sources of uncertainty that are quite large. Uh, 
which is the strength scatter, uh, reference data relevance, and the Vera exponent. And all of these three, they correspond to uh, sources uh, which, which correspond to the, to the strength and fatigue model. So if there's if, uh, anything that we should do here, then uh, maybe we should concentrate on understanding the, fa the fatigue models and, the, and, for example, making some, some reference tests to understand the fatigue life better. Uh, now I will go into some details on how you can use this VMA, or the result from the VMA, in order to derive a safety factor. Okay, so as I said, uh, what we use here when we want to derive the safety factor or safety margin for the design, it is the, the total uncertainty where we combine all the different sources of uncertainty that we use. And when we evaluate then the, the, the load and the strength here, then we shall not put any conservative choices on these, but we should try to compute the, the mean or the median values. So the, the, we should use the, the, the nominal values when we calculate the, to say the, the load and the strength. And then the idea is that the uncertainty here, that should, that it is uh, this uncertainty that, that should cover the, the safety afterwards. So in, uh, in this case, uh, we have uh, looked at the load and the strength, and we looked at the logarithmic properties here. So the uh, difference between the logarithmic strength and the log logarithmic load in this case is uh, 0 0.81 minus 0 0.47, which is 0 0.34. So that is the, so the difference between these two distributions. It means that it is uh, the, the difference here between the mean value between the mean value of these two distributions. So how do, do we then uh, derive the safety factor? Uh, in, uh, what we propose here is that we that we use a ninety five percent reliability, and that means that uh, if we then uh, take this uh, and uh, use the normal quantile here, the normal distribution here, it means that we should take 1.64 times the uncertainty that we have derived. That corresponds then to the 95% reliability in terms of a normal distribution. And that re then represents the safety margin in the log scale. And in order to derive the safety factor, then we take uh, the antilogarithm or the exp exponential of this 1.64 times tall, which means that we derive here at the safety factor of 1.41. And then in, in most cases, 95% uh, reliability is not, uh, is not enough. So therefore, we, we propose that uh, you should add an extra safety factor. But that should not be based on, uh, say, these uh, statistical estimates, but it should rather be based on the, on the risk and the cost that you are prepared to take. Uh, and and in, in this case, uh, uh, this example, we, we actually set this extra safety margin to zero. So we said that the, here, in, the, in this case, uh, there is no extra safety factor. So then uh, the total requirement in terms of safety margin is this, uh, is this 1.64 times tor plus the extra safety margin, and, uh, which be then becomes 0 0.34 which uh, turns out to be exactly the safety or the distance between the load and the strength in this case. So it just barely passes. And I should say that uh, uh, this uh, is an example in the early stage of the, of the de development here. Uh, so there's, there's been uh, quite substantial improvements both in the device and the other things. Uh, and uh, if we then go to the last step here about the improvement actions. So one important thing about the BMA is to is that it, it points out which sources of uncertainty is the most dominating ones, which then can help to say where should we put our resources in order to make improvements. Where do they pay pay off best? And some improvement actions here 
since uh, these calculations were made, there has been a quite a dramatic change in the device. Uh, this is a core power device, and they 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 use uh, what's called a latching mechanism, which means that they they got the, the boy stuck in the water, and then uh, the water rises, and they let it loose. It flies up in order to increase the speed, and thus uh, enables to get more energy out of the way. Now they re replace this with uh, what is called the wave spring, and the problem with the latching was that it it gave very large forces on the mower. Now this wave spring gives uh, much less forces, but uh, still increases the speed. So they have uh, improved the design, which means that it will reduce the loads, so that the, the safety margin here will be increased. And then, uh, if we look at the uncertainties here, if we want to do something here, it is the largest part here on the pie chart that we should concentrate on. And in this case, uh, we could say that uh, at least 75% of the uncertainty is coupled to the fatigue model or the fatigue life model. So therefore, it, it, uh, if, if you should go further here, it seems reasonable that to investigate the fatigue properties in more detail here, for example, by making laboratory tests of the steel wire in order to get more accurate data of the life. This has been a quite quick run through the VMA, uh, where I've put some examples, but not gone into real details about how to derive the different numbers. But uh, during uh, this afternoon, hopefully we'll get some more understanding on how to, how to derive these numbers. And when we present our case studies, uh, Tomorrow, there will be some more details and examples of how you really can assess sorry, the uncertainties and the sensitivities. But the basic uh, principle here is that in the early design stages, there we have the basic VMA, where the goal is to judge what are the, the most important sources of uncertainties, in order to distinguish between different design concepts. And then on the right hand side, we have the probabilistic ones that you can use in order to, to see what is the safety model and drive safety factors. workshop with both presentations and work with VMEA. Uh, as Per talked about yesterday, we had uh, presented uh, VMEA with uh, three levels, basic VMEA early, uh, during early design stages, and then more enhanced and uh, the full probabilistic VMEA when you have more details available. Uh, the procedure to do this are similar, but the details increase to the right. Uh, I have seen this 
method has been developed during the years and uh, Per and Thomas has been working with it quite a lot and other people at SP as well. Uh, as Per mentioned yesterday, we have been successfully working with it with the track aero industry and uh, actually also district heating and electronics, some parts, and now marine energy. So, uh, as I see it, the basic BMEA is the same for all these, but then uh, it needs to be adapted to the diff different business areas. And uh, I think this has been prosperous in the previous fields, and I hope it will contribute to marine energy more and more in the future. Uh, Thomas showed this uh, process uh, yesterday when you talked, I, I think it was, uh, you could get the impression that you cannot calculate anything because that's too many uncertainties <laughs> and uh, scattered, but uh, when we then see the methodology, it's actually uh, and they are put together, you can actually do quite a lot with the method. And uh, you have all these steps from the waves to the life, if that is the target of the analysis, and uh, with a lot of uncertainties along the steps that we discussed yesterday. Uh, I think one important thing is that, as Thomas said, engineers should rethink don't be on the safe side at all steps, but uh, use expected values and quantify uncertainties instead. And I think that's very important for the wave energy field because, and the marine energy all over, because um, you cannot over-design costs too much. You really, really need to be at an appropriate level. I think, um, it's interesting with the method. Uh, what I've seen compared to other methods and uh, other work and when I talk to other people, uh, there are some things that often are highlighted and what I believe is very good with the method and it's that it handles all type of variations, uh, uh, scatter and then uncertainties. And uh, as Thomas said yesterday, uh, you're not completely following the statistical rules when you merge these things together, but uh, it becomes a very useful tool to combine these. Otherwise, my feeling is that some people just work with uh, statistics where the, where the methods are applicable in detail, and then you need something else to do the other things. But I think this is a very good method to combine all variations uh, under one umbrella to get the total uncertainty. Uh, and of course it's uh, dominating sources. Uh, the total uncertainty, very important, you can from that calculate safety factors and uh, uh, when you then know which uncertainties that dominate, you can uh, achieve these benefits from, uh, uh, with uncertainty reduction. That could be to save costs or uh, avoid uh, sensitivity to some variations to uh, get a more robust design. And I think that's important. The VMEA procedure was presented yesterday and it follows the uh, statistical scheme that we also used in the Excel sheets during the workshop. Uh, important to have these engineers working in cross-functional teams, as Per talked about yesterday, that we meet because the method uh, gives a good way how to do things, but you need the competencies from different areas to uh, to get the data and uh, knowledge. As we also saw yesterday, the methodology could be used uh, irrespectively if you know a lot or if you know just a little. And I also think that's a strength. You can do uh, work with it in early design or late design stages. 
Uh, what I also think is of interest is to um, during operation, sometimes I've seen that in other fields that it could be of in interest to sometimes uh, use it for uh, remaining life, not when you design, but uh, when you are in a uh, during operation, you can uh, get updated information about the state of the equipment or the system, and then you can uh, do a remaining life calculation or extend it, extend life. That's a question that we have seen in many other fields. As the cycle, uh, product cycle becomes more and more cyclic with the uh, sustainability issues to close the loop with material, products and energy. I think uh, it's of an increasing interest to work also during the operation phase. Yeah, we uh, also talked a lot or there were presentations about this load and strength and what should be on the horizontal axis could be a lot of things. Yesterday we talked mainly about fatigue, but also uh, so, uh, uh, survivability, ultimate strength issues. There are a lot of other phenomena that could be relevant, and we saw some. Uh, you showed Elaine some interesting uh, pictures of failures, and that could be uh, a lot of different failures. And uh, as I see it, the method is very good to can be used for anything, or you can use it for uh, if you have a combination of two, fatigue and corrosion, you can, for instance, use it for fatigue, and then corrosion could degrade the strength gradually. It could be combined in different ways, either that you have several target functions with load and strength, or one target function and the other phenomena involving load or strength. So I think that's a strength as well with the method. We talked about the evil yesterday, <laughs> or five evils, or six evils, with some uh, check around and uh, we found that the external environmental load is the strongest evil. Uh, one question this morning during breakfast with some people, we discussed, uh, is this uh, for wave? representative for wave energy or for tidal energy, because that's maybe two different um, uh, states with these two. So that maybe that would be interesting uh, to check if there is a difference between the evils <laughs> in uh, tidal energy and uh, wave energy. Just one final thought. Uh, I'm working as a supervisor in a project uh, with Chalmers, a PhD project where simulations of a wave energy converter with a hub and a cable and mooring lines are made uh, with the main purpose to uh, calculate the fatigue life of the mooring lines and the cables. Uh, but we also have uh, calculated the energy uh, absorption or amount of energy conversion. And I think uh, yeah, the lower figure, we just took a model from biofouling to check how will uh, biofouling influence on one hand fatigue and on the other hand uh, energy absorption. And uh, it's not, it's influencing as is expected in a negative way, the fatigue damage increases and the uh, energy absorption decreases and uh, these type of uh, this type of information could be used of course for uh, operation and maintenance uh, discussions uh, when to clean and uh, such different things but uh, it could also be of interest to think about in a VME uh, perspective because uh, uh, we say that fatigue should not should uh, we should use the EMEA for fatigue to not dis over design, but on the other hand, essentially the same factors uh, that generate fatigue, uh, for instance, wave, uh, high, wave heights and uh, other harsh environments, 
uh, they also affect the absorbing power. So I think it's very interesting to uh, use, uh, to calculate both of these to get the balance because the energy absorption is related to re revenue and uh, fatigue is related to the cost in the, in the economic sheet. So, uh, and I think uh, it could be of interest to use EMEA also for uh, energy absorption. Uh, and you can do it on the same time with parallel sheets. <laughs> or, and the umbrella is, of course, the profit. Okay, that was some, just a few comments from yesterday. And if you have questions about that or SP or RICE, please contact somebody of us. Thank you. I think, you know, from uh, Thomas's and, and Per's position, these are some of the three reasons why um, we have VMEA um, as a flexible tool that can be used at the initial design stages, you know, all the way to uh, full system analysis. You know, um, certainly if you have very little data at the, at the early design stages, you know, you can still use this tool. The framework uh, that's being put together um, is generic and simple enough, um, uh, you know, regardless of the design and or product. So it is um, uh, the ability to be able to ut utilize this, you know, if you're in from the wind side, if you're at the tidal side, or if you're at the wave side. So it's being able to look at this. Um, um, I'm even sitting there looking at, you know, how we can do more statistical ana analysis just on the wave environment at, at EMEC you know, to sit there and do more statistical probability analysis on what we've got um, on our data site. So, you know, the, the value there is just, you know, really where, where you can use it. And then the last one is um, it does identify the, the critical points and the weakest links um, uh, throughout the, the whole design process. So, in summary, we hope that, um, that you all, you know, are able to sit there and take the spreadsheet, take the guideline that we're going to uh, be producing and start to play with it. And I think in about six months time, um, we're gonna probably uh, resend out an email or just a, a request to find out if people have been uh, utilizing um, uh, the methodology, because I'd be very interested to know, you know what the, the uptake is you know, on it. Um, we do have a, an industry advisory group, which is made up of um, with Bob Thresher and uh, Joachim Weber um, with NREL out of the United States, um, and Elizabeth Millay, who is actually with uh, EDF um, in France. So we've been going through um, and doing reviews with them, and we have our last review in the next you know couple of weeks. So we're going to, and they actually have the draft um, uh, guideline and are reviewing it and providing uh, feedback. So this has also been informed by, um, you know, uh, another group of, of, of experts. That's all I have. If there was anything else anybody else wanted to say, we'd like to hear it. If not, have a good afternoon. Thank you.